What's good, Internet? It's your boy, Corey, from the Hardwood Herald. We are here with my guy, CP, from Knicks Fan TV. How we doing today, dude? Good, man. Happy to be on with you, bro. How's everything? Everything is going as good as it possibly can, man. I'm getting excited. You know, um, you're somebody I look at as somebody who's taken the sports media landscape, I think, by storm. I think what you're doing is next level. You know, I remember I was... Uh, I was watching back one of my own videos on the TV and you know how sometimes YouTube just, you know, plays with the algorithm and your first, the, one of your videos came on and I was looking at it and it was an older episode or whatever. It said live and everything. And you had the chat going. It was like a, you know, a, a, a post game um, stream. And I was like, damn, like this is, this is official. Mm -hmm. And then somehow we cross paths on Twitter and, you know, I've been on your show or whatever, which was an honor. Um, but yeah, man, I'm 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 happy to to have you on because I think what you're doing, I think you're one of the the, the you know up and coming game changers in this business. Hey, I appreciate it, man. It's definitely a lot of work, um, but you know we, we found a white space with this that that we're trying to capitalize on. So we just on the grind on a daily basis, bro. So I definitely appreciate it. So so how did the idea of Knicks Fan TV come about? Yeah. So, I mean, I was born into the sports radio generation, you know, Mike and the Mad Dog. I was raised on Mike and the Mad Dog. You know, you used to go to take your kid to work day with your father and, and Mike and the Mad Dog would be blasting in the background. You, you're wondering what all these engineers are arguing about or what they're listening to. And that was, you know, my childhood, my passion for New York sports was about going to those shows to hear the recaps, hear the fan reactions, all the caller reactions and all the emotion. You know, New York sports, that, that's what it's all about. It's a thrill of victory, the agony and defeat. And Sports Talk Radio, Mike and the Mad Dog, they, they created it. They created that wave. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to recreate that in the, in the digital social media age. So, you know, another, um, uh, you know, another entity that does as well is the uh, English Premier League teams. So one of the, the channels that I was following, even though I don't even follow the sport that much, was Arsenal Fan TV. And it was a similar concept where they would do a lot of post-game reactions and, again, just capturing that emotion from the fan base. So I kind of wanted to spin it in my own way. And I feel like that's kind of what we started doing with Knicks Fan TV. So we started in the summer of 2017, NBA draft. I took my phone. I took a tripod, a little, you know, a little $20 tripod from Amazon, took the train into MSG and just started recording, just started recording content interviewing fans what's your reaction who do you think the Knicks are gonna pick you know once they did pick Frank it was a lot of it was a lot of uh, upset fans you know what I mean so capturing that reaction and everything and I just threw it up threw it up on the channel and and just started from there and that was the start of Knicks fan TV June of 2017. That's dope man what what was like the what was the response like when you first launched it you know, yeah <laughs> it's because it's, it's tough when you first launch something, right? Because you have this idea in your head, but you got to earn the trust of people. What was yeah, it? it's tough, man. It'll really make you want to quit, you know. But it's a, it's the ultimate test. It's the ultimate test of, of your passion to what you're doing, you know. Because in the beginning, you may get one view. You may get three views on a video, ten views on a video, so on and so forth. But with consistency, we started gaining steam. And then, you know, me and Jayla started doing split screen recaps or split screen live streams on Instagram. And then I say, you know what, let's move the post game reactions. I mean, the post game shows, let's do it live on YouTube. Because what happened was after the Frank video, I was doing post game recaps recorded and then putting them out the next day. And I say, you know what, this is a, it's too much tax. It's too much resources, too much time. And you lose that momentum. You know, sports is, is very much an uh, uh, instant reaction. And, and I think social media does such a great job of capturing that no matter the platform. So that's why we went to YouTube and started to do it live. So you, you mentioned Jay Ellis. Um, you know, what was your, uh, your relationship like him uh, with him like, you know, before you started this? Is, is this somebody that you were friends with before this? Is it somebody that was doing something that you thought was cool and you were like, yo, let's link up? Um, and how, how has he helped you? Because, you know... Yeah it's hard to do things by yourself. You need like-minded people, um, you know, to, to help you sometimes. Right. So, so how has that helped your channel? Yeah. Um, you know, since he came aboard, I didn't know him from a hole in the wall. I had no idea who he was, but it was just on Instagram, just surfing and following, you know, like-minded channels. I started following his stuff, started seeing when he would go live and started, you know, commenting there and then just hit him up, just DM him one day. I said, yo, let's do a collab. Let's, let's do a split screen. 
see how it goes. And we just started building little by little from there. And then, like I said, we we took it to uh, to YouTube. But, you know, the thing about JL is, yes, we're Knicks fans. Yes, we're like minded, but we also have complementary skill sets. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's big, especially in any type of venture that you're going into. You don't want to necessarily do things with your friends because you guys are boys and you think everything is going to be, you know, kosher in that regard. You want people who can also do some of the things that you can't or also have the skill sets that you don't. And so that's where Jay Ellis came into play as well. And so it, it was very complimentary to start it. I think you, you touch on something that you just DM'd him to for a collab, right? And I think that that's something that, uh, you know, a lot of people that are coming up, you know, shouldn't be afraid to do. Like sometimes you might DM somebody and uh, you might not get a response, but but other times you'll DM somebody, right? And and you can make magic with, with the yeah. person that you're trying to link up with. So um, yeah, and, and, and on, on that topic, you know, I was speaking to another uh, creator, um, a big time creator as well, you know, certainly has a, has a budding platform as of his own. And as he was kind of asking me for advice, I said, you know, how often do you collaborate with the other content creators in your space? He's like, to be honest, I don't follow any of them. And, you know, it's an ego thing. It's an ego thing, especially as men. You, you don't want to necessarily, you know, reach out to your quote unquote competition. But what I was telling him is, you know, you can't look at it that way. You have to look at it as um, you're continuing to build your brand. Maybe you can bring something to that person's channel that brings insight to that person's audience. And they, in turn, come back to you, you know, and and that's how I, I, I see it. You know, it, it's it's um, it, it it's a rising tide lifts all boats type of thing. So never be afraid to collaborate with others or, or have an ego in terms of that nature because you stunt your growth by doing that. Yeah, for sure. You know, I came up, I worked in uh, in music for a long time. And, uh, you know, I toured all around the country, out of the country. And one of the things you realize is like how much touring with other acts helps you. Because what you're doing is you're bringing your audience, they're bringing their audience, and you link up and now you hope that there's a crossover. Facts. You know? So when you have, you know, all of these people on every week, you know, it not only are you helping them, but you're hoping that they bring, you know, some new views, viewers to you. And, you know, with the, the internet age, all you need is one person to hop on. They, they hit retweet or whatever. And next thing you know, you know, you got a bunch more eyeballs on. So that's it. That, that, that's it. Up. That's it. It's law of numbers, man. That, that's how I look at it. That's it. How, uh, how has Nick's fan TV evolved over, over the years since you started it? Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, the first one was kind of like a fan on the street style uh, show. And then we went to recording post games from recorded post games. We went to live streaming. Then we went to live streaming from Instagram to live stream on YouTube, then to live streaming, taking in caller, uh, caller reactions, you know, so we continue to grow. And then we did um, fan cave episodes. We did two dope fan cave episodes where we went to, you know, uh, die hard Knicks fans homes, they showed off their collections, their memorabilia, and things of that nature. Again, another way to to tell stories uh, of this historic franchise. You know, has, haven't won too much, but there, there's certainly a lot of stories to be told. And then we got into player interviews, you know, and that's really picked up steam, especially during the pandemic. The quarantine stream was, was really good content. We brought in the beat writers to give the fans insight into the team, those who cover the team on a daily basis. You want to know about the draft or bringing in scouts like yourself, somebody who studies NCAA basketball, the ins and outs, you know, so it's really evolved um, a ton. And now we're kind of going into various lanes of content to, to serve our audience. You know, you mentioned you having all of these people hop on the streams. You know, you've had Jamal Crawford hop on, right? You, you had Chuck D who gave you guys a shout out on uh, major, TV, major. Right? Yeah, that was, that was dope. Mm -hmm. Who is, you know, the first person that you reached out to that they were like, yeah, I'll hop on. And you were like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> first person, Chris Childs. First person was good. First Chris person Childs. on the beat. First person on the beat was first guest was yeah. Tommy Bear Forbes magazine. He was on the beat. Very generous with us and, and came on and, and knocked it out. Player wise, it was Chris Childs. And, and that was um, that was crazy. So when I reached out to him, he instantly was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, like I didn't have a format. I didn't have questions. You know, I had never really done like a serious interview of that magnitude. So 
my whole reaction was like, yo, we got to hit this shit out the park. Like this, I told you else. I was like, this is it right here. Like we got to come correct, make sure all the gauges, all the switches, and knobs are working and, and knock this thing out. And Chris came on. He talked to us like we were his friends. His stories were excellent. His stories were hilarious. And it, it was just, um, it was great. The fans really enjoyed it that night. What do you think it is about traditional sports media right now mm -hmm. that has people looking for, you know, more independent platforms, you know, yeah. looking for something else? What is it that, that people are tired of? Well, I think you, you hit it on the head. It's traditional, you know, and sports media, sports broadcasts really haven't changed that drastically over the last few decades. And so I think people are looking for, number one, I think they're looking for authenticity. When you look at some of the big boys, the ESPNs, even the MSG to a certain extent, it's very cookie cutter. When you go to ESPN or, you know, SNY, they, they're telling you about the Knicks at a very high level, right? What are, what are the, the controversial topics, the Spike Lee incident, the Oakley incident, is KD coming to the Knicks, so on and so forth. Uh, we conversely, we're going to talk about, yeah, we'll talk about that and get the fan reactions to it, but we're going to talk about the, the, the rookie in the lottery all the way down to the guy in the G league that's on the come up. So we're, we're trying to inform you about everything about the team that a lot of these major platforms either don't care to, or just don't have the time to. So that's when, you know, we're really able to niche it down and deliver to the audience. Like I said, another factor is the authenticity, you know, when the fan, looks comes to our channel they see me as one of them you know i'm an administrator of the channel i'm a producer of the channel i'm going to give you uh and on every show you're going to be entertained you're going to be informed and so i think that's what people are drawn to now in this social media age is um the community aspect of it we're building a community and and again that authenticity feel you you, you can't recreate that on these major platforms they, they're just not able to do that and cover the team as in depth as we can. Yeah, I think, you know, the word community hits hits hard, right? Because that's what you built. You built yeah. a community. You get, you know, people running to you guys after a game. You know, it's been a while since we've had games, you know, in New mm -hmm. York, but they'd rather come to you than go tune into MSG post game, right? Because they know that you're somebody like you said, like them that that they see themselves in a little bit you know they see themselves in the fan you don't got a suit on right you got a snapback you got a jersey on it feels more real it feels more authentic and it mm -hmm. keeps them coming back and then you engage them and i think that's huge right you don't they're in the chat you got the chat up <laughs> on the screen and you're engaging them um yeah at what point were you like maybe a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of comments that you were actually getting in the chat yeah. um, and trying to balance like topics with going into the chat and, 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 you know, engaging your audience. It's hard. It's hard as hell, man. When you're running a live show, you know, and, and sometimes we'll get, we'll get constructive feedback and we always welcome it. Sometimes we get the haters and for the haters I say, listen, you know, it's not easy producing, directing and, and hosting a live show. There's so many things that you're trying to manage Make sure that's in the right place. Make sure all your gauges are up. Make sure your sound is working. Your lighting is good. And then you got to talk about <laughs> talk about the game. So it's a lot that you have to manage. But, um, you know, we've taken on a lot of moderators for our live chat. I have an intern on our team, Knicks Fan TV, Dave. Shout out to Dave. We have volunteers uh, that also help us with the content. So as we've grown, we've expanded the team a little bit to take some of that, you know, that workload off of me. And, and so it's been working out very well so far. So when I came on um, for the draft lottery episode, mm -hmm. uh, you had Manscaped sponsor it, mm -hmm. right? Now, as a DIY operation, how do you, how have you approached looking for advertisers? Is this something that you're now you feel like you actually have the platform that you can go out and look for? Are you waiting for people to kind of, you know, maybe follow, you know, find you guys? Mm -hmm. And is that something that you're, you know, thinking is, you know, something you want to take a little bit to the next level and, and kind of integrate into, you know, what you do more often. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, we have a budding platform, a, a niche platform, but uh, with that, you have audience demographics, you know, uh, along with intellectual property, data is like gold. And that's what these sponsors want to see. They want to see what your demographics look like. Does it fit their target market? And you want to introduce them to this new alternative form of media. And so I think that's what we've done. We've we've built our platform. We've built guest after guest after guest. 
pull those demographics out and, and we pitch it, you know, we pitch it to these brands and not just anything, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to cheapen my product at all. These are definitely companies that um, have products that I would support or that I would uh, recommend to you. You know, I'm not just going to throw something out there that I haven't tried myself or that I wouldn't rock with myself. So we're not trying to cheapen the brand by any means, but it's just a lot of trial and error. You know, it's just a lot of trial and error looking for those brands that uh, may be interested in marketing to your target market. Uh, again, with a quality product, you try it out and see if they're willing to, uh, you know, roll the dice and experiment on, on the platform. What is your end goal with the platform? Like if SNY or Bleacher Report, you know, one of these big conglomerates come calling, trying to buy you guys out or, you know, is that something you guys would be interested in? Or are you like, yo, we're building a community. I see where this is going. And I think we could do this ourselves. You know, do, do you have like, yeah. you know, a vision or, you know, are you open to just kind of taking what's going to come to you? Yeah, you know what? I, my vision for this is is to build a network with with Knicks Fan TV being that that pillar content for that network or that flagship flagship show for that network. So I'm going to continue to uh, build shows within my channel and then uh, branch out and build a network of you know like minded um, shows with like minded creators, and and that's what it's all about. We, we're going to build that that ne next network. I'm going to be on my Sumner Redstone, you know, my Rupert Murdoch mix, you know, just a little bit more debonair, and, and so that's what we're going to do, man. We're going to take it on in, in this digital frontier. Um, I would say, you know, with the, with the major players, the Bleacher Reports, and so on, I don't think you should ever shut the door to those type of opportunities, especially if it meets your goals, whatever they may be. But I think, I think the, um, what you want to do is be strategic about it, you know, and not again, give up your intellectual property or give up your data because those things are more valuable than gold these days. So I think it's not to slam the door on those. Of course, I want to keep it independent and you always want to remain independent, but be strategic in terms of, um, how you work with these guys? Is it a partnership? Is it a licensing agreement? You know, do I keep ownership of of my content? That that's very important. We see we saw that with uh, Joe Button and Spotify. You know, the the issues that they were going through. And Joe, I love that. You know, he took his audience through that journey. And yes, he did go to Spotify, but that wasn't the end game. The end game was to try to infiltrate and learn. Uh, what they were doing behind the scenes, how they were calculating engagement behind the scenes, um, were they getting their fair share, you know, and, and knowing your, your worth. And that's what Joe Button, that was the lesson that he was trying to preach in terms of when they left Spotify. So um, similar, you know, similar. It, it, it's just being strategic with these um, relationships. And if it doesn't work out that way, continuing to chart on that path of independence and, and being that grassroots for the fans by the fans movement. One last question. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, you go on Twitter. There are new podcasts, Twitter accounts, you know, websites, networks popping up by, you know, the hundreds, thousands every day. What would, you know, what advice would you give anybody kind of looking to break into the business in a non-traditional way, you know, the kid who didn't go to journalism school, the kid who who didn't go and get a degree in sports management, just somebody who is like, I think I, you know, I could do this. I have a passion for it and I want to go for it. Yeah, it, it's funny because that was the original start when I was first going to school. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do sports I'm gonna do sports <laughs> management. And then, you know, I, I got scared when it didn't seem like there's very much very, you know, good opportunities to make a living. You know, I was all about making money in those days. So I abandoned that. And, you know, years and years and years later, it's, you know, I'm, I'm back in that lane. So it's it's very non-traditional, as you said. Um, but my advice, I would say a couple things. Number one. Definitely find your lane. Right. Find your lane. What is your interest in sports in particular? Is it a particular team? Is it an aspect of sports? Is it the draft? Is it the business side of sports? You know, find your lane and niche it down, you know, niche it down, niche it down. This is what, you know, having a lot of options um, creates, especially in the media landscape, is that it creates these little, little um, micro segment segments 
where people build communities around a particular topic of interest. So you don't have to cover every single sport and every single major topic. You don't have to cover the whole NBA at large if you don't want to. You know, if you're able to do that and you and you have the insights and the expertise in it, by all means, go for it. But um, in media, what they say is the riches is in the niches, right? So find that niche and double down on it. And then I would say um, be hungry. You know, be hungry. Um, can you be consistent? Can you take a month where you can create a new piece of content once a week? Just start with once a week. You know, I think a lot of people put pressure on themselves and say, I got to create, I got to create, I got to create. Just try to be consistent, you know, for a month in and month out basis where you're getting low views, you're not getting any money, you're losing sleep, you, you know, you have a day job. This is very tough. And if you can get through those those tough stages in the beginning, then you know that you truly found your passion. And then again, double down on it. And then I would say, um, like I said in the beginning, network and collaborate. Always be networking, always be engaging. I think one of the things is, is that sports media now, the barrier of entry is very low. So there's a lot of competition. But the authentic voices are going to rise above the crop. And also those who stay engaged are going to rise above the crop. So it's not just about posting your content on Twitter, posting your content on YouTube and saying, hey, you know, listen to this, listen to this, because everybody's doing that. You have to be able to get into authentic conversations, authentic engagement. And then that person who you're talking to will click on your profile and say, hey, what do they do? OK, let me check them out. Oh, they they did this last night. OK, let me share this with Corey. You know what I mean? Check this show out. Corey then shares it with his group and so on. And so that's how you grow, especially with this hyper competition It's hyper competitive. So you have to continue to network and collaborate uh, as, and, and you'll grow your following that way. Well said, man. You know, I, I think that that's one of the things that, that people don't understand. Like, you know, you got to support people the way you want to be supported too. Right. right. Like, if you want somebody to share some stuff out, build a relationship with that person, make them feel like they, they can invest in you. And, right. uh, and, and I think that you guys, <laughs> you've done it. Uh, you know, the people you work with, collaborate with have done it. You know, everybody feels like, you know, you are reachable, you're attainable, but you're putting this platform, um, you know, out on, on the internet for Knicks fans that they feel like they can go to and be a part of and build in that community. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, like I said, since the first video I saw, I've been super impressed with it um, by the production, the work, the consistency, the grind. I mean, we're in a pandemic and you got a Knicks show. The Knicks haven't played since, you know, what, March? March. Yeah. <laughs> and, March. You've been, and you've been putting consistent episodes out, finding ways, you know, with the draft. It's getting pushed back. You're still you're having new draft people on all the time. You're doing all of these different things. Um, and like you said, the consistency, the consistency that, you know, you've, you've been able to do and the creativity, um, over this whole period has been, you know, really awesome to watch. So, uh, thank you for doing this, man. Um, I'm excited to put this on paper. I'll be excited to, to get this out in video and, uh, yeah, I appreciate you, uh, stopping by. Yeah, definitely, man. And I would just say, um, oh, two more quick things. I, I would just yeah. say that, you know, um, through this time, I think the most rewarding thing as you grow and as you see your, your following come up is like, especially for those people that are out of town globally around the world, you know, you get those DMs from people, guy be like, you know, I'm from, I'm from North Dakota. I'm from Calgary. There's no Knicks fans out here. I have nobody to talk to about it. You know, bringing those people into the mix that's a very rewarding thing. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't know how that, that feels like I was born and raised in New York, New York. You talk about Knicks, Yankees, Jets to anybody, you know, to a stranger on the street, you can get into a full blown conversation with. So you never have that void that some other people have. And then also through this pandemic, you know, it's put a lot of stress on people, especially mentally. And I couldn't tell you how many people have DM me and said, you know what, you know, I've been in a tough place. This show gets me through it. You know, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. This show really, you know, helps me, you know, is it welcome distraction and so on and so forth. So those sort of things really, um, you know, keep you motivated to, to continue to, to grow the, the brand. Yeah, no doubt, man. You know, I, I, I am like that. I'm the Bulls fan in New York. 
Yeah, you know, there you go. Right. I can't, you know, I could talk about maybe Michael Jordan with, you know, a stranger on the street, but I can't mm. get into why Kirk Heinrich is my all time favorite player with just anybody. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, the, you know, the internet communities that you find, like you said, those niche communities, um, you know, they, they mean something, you know, right. I think my longest consistent relationship has been with the real GM Chicago Bulls, you know, message board. I've been mm -hmm. on that since I was in high school and, you know, I, I think I signed up in 2003. Right. So, you know, it, it, those communities that you build all around the country, around the world, they, you know, they become a part of you. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, it, I'm glad you touched on that, man. It, it definitely matters. And it goes to uh, one more thing in terms of uh, um, tips. You know, it was one that I told Jay Ellis. Uh, it was funny. I was telling Jay Ellis this as we were walking into the MSG for a game. And I was like, bro, you never know who's watching. We got to keep doing this on YouTube. You never know who's watching. Two seconds later, you know, we get approached by NYPD officer. Love your show. Boom, boom, boom. Walk upstairs, get approached by just random fans. You know, love the show. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And, and so I tell JL, so I'm like, you never know who's watching. And then shortly after that, we get a Twitter shout out from Chuck D. You know, <laughs> Chuck D, I just signed up for Knicks Fan TV. And it's just little things like that. Like I'm telling JL, so you never know who's watching. And so... Um, I think you you had a question in terms of like what was my favorite um, interviews or, or something like that. Um, yeah. There was a lot, you know. I would definitely say Rasheed Wallace being one of my favorite players um, was definitely up there because you know, first of all, he doesn't do a lot of interviews, so for him to do hours, you know, meant a lot. It meant a lot, and then he gave us an hour of his time. That meant a lot. Jamal Crawford, another one of my favorite players. Um, that one meant a lot. You know, Xavier McDaniel, that's been our highest viewed video with between the long form interview and the micro content. We amassed over 160,000 views on Xavier McDaniel interview. And, and that was um, that one hit it out the park. But with Chuck D, um, with him embracing us at such an early stage in, in the game and then, you know, what he can bring to our channel is that, you know, you, you see the confluence of hip hop and basketball and how it's basically emerged into one culture. Yes. When you look at the rise of public enemy and the rise of basketball going into the eighties, you know, mm -hmm. getting out of the cocaine era, going into uh, bird and magic and ultimately into the Jordan era, you know, Chuck D lived that because that was at the same time when, when hip hop and public enemy was taken off. Yep. So he's seen the two really merge, you know, out of the ashes. And so he's able to tell those stories that, you know, no one else can tell because he lived it. He experienced yep. it and, and he's seen it. So when we've had content like, you know, remembering the late great Kobe Bryant and having Chuck come on and, and give his perspective, his first canned account of meeting Kobe and what he meant to the game. You know, John Thompson, the passing of John Thompson, having Chuck D come on and talk about what, what Georgetown meant to the culture. And also, obviously, with everything with the coronavirus and civil unrest, you know, again, having him come on and, and tell those stories because he's lived it. it yep. It's been his, his contributions to the channel have been valuable. And then on top of that, having him as a mentor. Um, it means a lot. Yeah, that's that's what's up, man. Thank you for doing this again. Um, I appreciate it always. Every conversation we have is a is a good one, and uh, you know I appreciate real basketball talk, real basketball analysis, and real passion, um, especially from New York and the level of pre of uh, appreciation that I have for for the diehard Knicks fans uh, out there. We're a special bunch, man, but I, I definitely appreciate it. Anytime, bro. Love to do these things.